<laughs> Thanks, Mark, for the time. Um, this question had come into my mind actually a couple of years ago, but it, it reemerged even just the other day. I remember uh, Putin had been bringing in Western journalists. I remember John Stackhouse, I think, had gone there. They'd bring these sort of like little round tables. I always kind of wondered why. I mean, I figured he's always kind of putting his own spin on it. But what the broader goal was and the effectiveness of that was, and I see <clears throat> even this week, CBC and I think other Canadian outlets were brought into Syria by Putin and the Russians to sort of show the development that's gone on since they've been there. Mm. And, I, and, I, and on the surface, it can seem a bit obvious, but I like your assessment on what's the, what's the goal there, like Russia's and Putin's broader goal there of, of trying to bring in Western media that in some sense you think they don't really care about, but what's the goal and how effective do you think that'll be? Because I found it really interesting again this week that they're once again doing it in Syria this time. Uh, thank you for the question. On, on the first, um, those journalist roundtables, they, they stopped when, when uh, Russia left the G8. Is my microphone still going? Okay. Um, it, 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 those were roundtables sent around the G8. So there'd be one reporter um, from each of the other seven countries was invited. Uh, I think that happened twice, and both were before Russia was hosting a G8 summit. Um, and I, I was there when John, I, I didn't go play hockey with Mr. Putin, but I was there sort of uh, in the city sort of helping navigate things. But um, it, I mean, I think it's simply just to, um, you know, if there, if there is an overarching foreign policy goal of, of uh, Putin's time in office, I think it's just to, to restore Russia's place at the, at the global table. And uh, when they were in the G8, I think they were quite proud of, of that position and, and, and wanted to be, you know, seen as one of the great powers of the world. On the Syria file, I mean, those trips, those, they seem very choreographed to show that you know, Russia's intervention there has been for the positive that Syria is a safer place than it was before they intervened. Um, obviously, they'd be tightly, tightly controlled trips. I haven't been on one. But I, I did go on a, a Russian government trip to Grozny back during the uh, Chechen Wars. And, and it was, you know, they were trying to show, look, this, um, this, this place is back under control. Our policy has been successful. Because they get a lot of criticism about Chechnya, about Syria in the Western media. And they're, they're, they're actually sensitive to it. Um, but I remember when we were sitting there in this, that we were getting this lecture about how wonderful life thing, things in Grozny were, and then a mortar shell came. <laughs> and uh, the, the guy giving the speech sort of, he didn't blink, but the rest of us hit the ground. And uh, he, when we got back up, he's, he said, uh, you know, the, the sun was going down. He goes, well, everything I said is, you know, by day. By night is a different pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it might be a similar experience to go to Syria right now. <laughs> And, and yet it works. I mean, uh, Chris Brown from the CBC is doing these reports now in Syria, escorted by the Russians. And he, he couches it all with, I am here with Russian minders. And he's framing every point about this is sort of probably what they want me to be reporting. But he's still reporting it. And we're still hearing it. And I think to some degree they are getting their agenda. They're accomplishing their agenda. A lot, well, a lot of American reporters arrived in Baghdad with the American army, right? I mean, this, this, this is a practice used by governments around the world. Mm -hmm. um, we tend not to embed at the globe, and I think the star was the same. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, you know, it, 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 the reason why they do it is it does help them get their message out, not just the Russian government. Yeah. It's not inherently evil. <laughs> <laughs> Nate. Uh, thank you very much for speaking with us tonight. I'm curious how you, as a journalist, uh, cut through the uh, the the steep disinformation that Russia puts out there, uh, call it spin, call it outright lies, wherever you want. But I, I know, for example, during the annexation of Crimea, uh, you know, people who we now know to be Russian soldiers were you know, invading, marching across the border but without Russian badges on their uniforms. So I'm curious how you, you get through all that. That's, that's a very good question. Thank you. And it's with difficulty, because we have this standard um, in Western journalism that we're taught at Carleton University and other journalism schools that you have to, you know, you have to be biased, sorry, unbiased, and you have to be neutral. Um, I've, over time, preferred the word objective to neutral, because that's, uh, I think, better. But you still have to put into every article from Crimea, you can put in your assessment, as I did, that, you know, these look a lot like Russian troops. I mean, a ragtag militia does not have all the same boots that are all shined up, right? I mean, this, is, this was something very different, and you could see that happening. But you had to include, under our own standards, that I think they take, not just they, but many forces these days take advantage of, this contrary argument. Well, they say that this wasn't. You know, like, Russia denies this, and, and uh, they say this is all uh, people's militia. So, and, and, you know, I, when I was in the, in the Middle East, um, I remember covering uh, sort of 
some truly horrific incidents in the Gaza Strip. And in one of them, uh, there was a, a shell fired from an Israeli ship offshore and it hit some kids that were playing on the beach. And the Israeli, um, what they t told us was, you know, that the kids had some, you know, the, the, there had been a landmine planted on the beach by Hamas, and, and they, they were to blame. And, and you could see from the impact from uh, in, in every serious report that went into it said that this was clearly fired from outside. But we had to now include in our story. And so for those who want to believe, that, uh, if you're somebody who is pro-Russian or pro-Israeli, um, they, they put that line in mostly for their own base to, to grab onto and to pass the story onwards. But yeah, it's it's incredibly frustrating because you they take advantage of, of our attempts to, <laughs> to to stay uh, to stay neutral, and it makes it you know it, it's infuriating to be honest. Some days that you have to include that line, but we, we we continue to do so. But you worked on Parliament Hill, so you had a lot of <laughs> very true, very very fair point. A lot it's, of training. It, it's a lot of uh, yeah, misinformation. It's not a new uh, thing. It wasn't invented by by Putin or the Israelis or anyone. It's just <laughs> how it goes. Okay, Craig. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, so I'm wondering what's your strategy for establishing sources when you land in a, in a country you haven't been before, um, and whether that changes based on factors, uh, how much language you, you speak in the country, whether you're there for a week or for a year, and just in general, how do you know who to trust and who, who will be a, a source you can rely on? That's, that's a very good uh, question. and, and um, it's changed a lot with, with the uh, rise of social media because now you can sort of, you can follow on Twitter or on something else, you can follow people who are tweeting at you from, let's say, Cambodia, and you can sort of watch for two weeks and say, this person has a perspective that I'm going to want to, I'm going to talk, talk to them about what happened there. This person was an eyewitness. I'm going to go and find them. Um, and that's, of course, if you're com comfortable with the media, uh, with the language, rather. Um, in the past, before... We had this ability to sort of see the conversation and 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 and, and sort of approach people from you know I'm going to be in your country in two weeks. Can we meet for a coffee? Um, and you've already had the opportunity to sort of weigh them up and figure out whether you find them credible. Um, I would often um, hire a local journalist and just basically outbid their you know pay them enough to call in sick. And uh, so you'd fly into this place, and you'd make, have an arrangement to, you know, find the person who works at the local paper. And uh, I did this in Zimbabwe, where I basically I uh, approached the local reporter, said I was a fan of their work, and uh, you know, what would it cost for him to call in sick for a few days? And then, sort of, you're, you're buying his network. In this case, it was a male, um, his network of contacts, and, and you're you're trusting him because you trust his work. Um, obviously, these things can go wrong, and you can end up trusting the wrong people. But that's that. You know, it, it is always, um, especially doing a job that like I have now, where you're going to different countries. Um, you know, sometimes week one week after another, it's uh, it, it's obviously a, ch a risk and a challenge. And I'm very lucky that social media has given us this this advantage. But um, you know, back in the day, that was the, one of the big arguments that for having a bureau in so many different places is you could only you had to embed yourself in the society to to um, to know who to trust and to make inroads. Okay. I just want to check uh, with the facilitator in the audience if there's anyone who has, who's too shy to come to the mic, if anyone has written a question on a card, if we, if we can get them up here. Go ahead. Uh, my question is about the regime itself. Uh, we hear a lot about Putin and the oligarch class and recently about organizations like the FSB. But I don't think we hear too much about the conventional military. So I was wondering what your sense is of the role that they play within the regime itself, what their loyalty is to Putin, and how they've changed since you first started covering Russia. Um, I think the military is um, the, the military that I saw in Chechnya in 2002, 2003, 2004, when I was covering that conflict, and the military that I saw in Crimea are two vastly different beasts, and you could see this is now a, a well-funded, I, I would suspect well-paid um, force, at least this, this spear chip that we saw there. And I think that would buy a lot of loyalty from the senior units. And, and um, it is, the regime, I think, when you talk, one of the, one of the difficult questions, when you, you ask, you know, what, what, what comes after Putin? I don't think they have that answer yet. And so that creates, um, everybody's nervous of, about you know, the day that he steps aside or something happens. And so that, the, right now it is, there, I think there's a lot of loyalty to Putin at the, uh, at various levels because there's not, 
there's no obvious choice. It's not like you think, oh, if, if he wasn't there, then we'd have this person instead. Um, but he did create um, the National Guard recently, which is sort of a, a separate structure um, from the military. And it, it, it does suggest some concern. Is, this is, it reports to a, a foreign bodyguard of his. And that, that suggests that you know, uh, perhaps he's not entirely comfortable with um, about the loyalty levels of, of other uh, leaders. Um, it's, it, you know, like I said, I was there last month, and I was trying to ask about the, the coming election season. And everybody expects that Putin will run again, and he'll win and get six more years. And then you ask, what about after that? I mean, there's just not a, you know, his party, United Russia, doesn't have uh, an obvious successor uh, coming up. I think Dmitry Medvedev's not uh, seen as someone who can rule again. And so they, there, there will be, I think, in this coming six years, a real jousting behind the scenes to uh, to decide what uh, who comes next. Okay. Yeah, Hi, Mark. I actually have a couple questions for you tonight. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, so my first one is uh, you graduated in 1997. Um, you emerged <laughs> into your journalism career along with the boom of the internet. And I was wondering how you thought that the access to information and the advances in technology have affected journalism as we know it today. Oh, the good old days when my readers couldn't get to my uh, get to my email account. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's that's a bit of a joke, but it, it, you know, um, be, it used to be when I first arrived in Moscow, you sort of filed these stories off, and you never heard back. And now you get instantly um, sort of all the uh, all the different opinions in the world appearing under your story, and and that that influences you. Um, it's it's. The fact that no one pays for media online, obviously, has been uh, devastating. I, I talked briefly about how we have so many fewer, fewer bureaus. We have a lot fewer reporters than we do when I started this. And that um, is a direct result of the technological revolution. Um, I hope, uh, you know, going way back to 1997, um, there was uh, something called Napster back then. And nobody paid for music. And uh, the idea that you know, the music industry was in great trouble and no one was ever going to pay for a, for a song again. And then iTunes came along and sort of solved it. And I, I, I fondly tr hope and trust that someone is working on something similar for, for the information media industry. Um, but uh, yeah, someone wiser than me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my other question was, you've seen a lot of, frankly, disturbing and frightening stories in your career. Emotionally, how do you process and deal with these sort of events? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I, you know, it's funny because I'm not someone who, I mean, I've seen, I have been to a lot of these terrible events and, and you don't, uh, at the time, I'm just such a, um, a bit of a, you know, I'm so focused on the task of, of getting the information out that I don't often react. It's, it's, I remember when I covered the initial invasion of Iraq, um, I was there for six weeks and there was a lot of horrible things that I won't share with you right now, but um, yeah, I, I can, there was, uh, well, I will share one. I remember there was a, uh, we, we got stuck, myself and another one of the 75, uh, Nala Ayad from CBC, got stuck on a bridge between um, what was now very famous, the Abu Ghraib prison in the city of Baghdad. And there was a firefight in front of us and a firefight behind us. And, and our convoy of cars just had to park there and uh, on this bridge. And we spent the night sleeping in our cars wondering what was going to happen. And uh, my translator is a Jordanian guy. And he kind of got, got courageous and went under the bridge. And then he said, you got to see this. And it was, it was a car with a, a body that had been flamethrowered in there. And you're just like, ugh. Um, but it, you know, I just carried on, nothing happened. And then I was flying back home uh, at the end of the six weeks. I was actually flying to Toronto, Mos on the, the old Aeroflot, uh, Moscow to Toronto. And I got up and I just, had, you know, it, it all hit me then, like as I was leaving, you know, sort of uh, I experienced, I guess, vertigo. But it was probably just like the, the stress of it all. But it is, I just, when I'm, in the, when I'm in the scene, I guess I just push it off. And later on, you sort of realize what you went through. Um, I'm not sure, I guess the answer is probably I'm not processing it very well. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of counseling does the Globe offer? Do they routinely offer counseling to reporters, or do you have to reach out and ask for it? Camera off. Uh, no, I've never had counseling. There's yeah. nothing. I mean, that that's a, um, probably something they should be doing, but I've, it's never been up, never come up. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we've got a few more. I think we're okay for time, so we'll just keep rolling along. Okay. Uh, hi, Mark. First of all, thank you so much for the in interesting talk. 
Uh, so as you said, you've covered Russia and Eastern Europe over a long, longer period of time, and you've co you cover the bigger picture more generally, even um, like you know for other regions. So my question is about regression, because you said you covered Russia when it was Putin was kind of elected, and it was still, still a time when he kind of would still listen to the Eastern, but also Western influences. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen a lot of that, um, even in e other Eastern European states, like places like Hungary that have had very high hopes for, you know, democracy and it's regressing. Uh, Turkey that was the leading in a secular Islamic democracy and is now completely regressing. So my question is, over these long periods of coverage, what are the patterns of regression that you've noticed and how can journalists better cover those patterns, especially in the 24-hour news cycle? That's a very good question. Um, and you could add the United States perhaps to that list. Um, <laughs> it, you know, when you're talking, you know, on Russia, Hungary, Poland, Turkey, those they are all are all very similar. That um, I remember flying up to do a to cover a conference in in Istanbul um, because this you know newly elected President Tayyip Erdogan, you know, he was the hope that was going to show you know democracy could work in the Middle East, and um, it it happens slowly. And I think um, the the when I talked when. Uh, Alan asked me earlier on about sort of the stories that I wish we'd covered, and, I, and it was these really, they seem like minor incidents at the time. You know, some radio station gets closed down, and, and this, you know, this is something you see right now in Poland happening as we speak, sort of uh, different voices are being taken off the air. Same with Hungary, Turkey right now, this massive crackdown on opposition media. And they don't look like, you know, when, you ha when you're weighing, um, you know, there's a flood in, uh, in Houston, and there's a North Korean missile crisis, and you've got a page and a half for foreign news. It's just never going to make it. Um, but, and I think the Globe has done a much better job of this uh, in the last few years, of you know, just sort of taking the, the our Saturday section and just saying, let's use this p space to take a step back. And I think those other things, like the crisis in North Korea, the, 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 there, there's so many other reporters watching that, that we add almost no value as a news organization if we're also just gonna have somebody else standing in the de demilitarized zone in Seoul, and we have to back up and look for um, look for things like that, look for, look for the, the attack on institutions. And, and it, you, know, you have to have a committed editor, and you have to have um, sort of patient readers who, who care about this stuff, but uh, you know, we're fortunate at the Globe to have that. But um, there's always this bias that you know, at, the, at the end of the day, something exciting, some flashy object is coming, and, and you drop these projects and you run off. And, we're, and that was a, a huge problem at, at, at the Globe and probably most media organizations even five years ago. And now we're sort of realizing that we're not adding anything. We're just running with the pack. And if that's the case, then we can't charge people $20 subscriptions if we don't have anything different behind that paywall. So. Um, hopefully we're learning the lesson, but that was a, that was a good question. <laughs>